Good morning and welcome to Tales of the Cocktail, Mexico City. I have a special word for all my Spanish-speaking friends here. Hola. <laughs> and everybody else, this would be a great time to put on your headsets. Today's very first seminar is a very frivolous, funny seminar about a very serious topic, hospitality, something that has been neglected in the past. Everything that our esteemed presenter here will be talking about is done in an irreverent and funny and frivolous way, but at the heart of it all, is something very serious indeed. Much like our sponsor today, Monkey Shoulder Blended Malt Scotch Whiskey. A whiskey that's not afraid to have a bit of fun and poke fun even at itself, but at the heart of Monkey Shoulder is some very serious and delicious whiskey indeed. Hopefully you'll get a chance to try it uh, today and certainly tomorrow. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our presenter, the award-winning, multi-esteemed, globe-trotting, Irishman, pineapple ambassador, shorts-wearing, hospitality magnet, Mr. Dean Callan, everybody. Thank you very much, Bill. Okay. Thank you. So I just want to start by saying I'm super nervous, okay? So if I start talking too fast or I'm shaking or anything like that, it's because I'm nervous. So to begin with, I'll introduce myself a little further. My name is Dean Callan. I'm the global brand ambassador for Monkey Shoulder. Uh, I started out as a bartender. I always wanted to be a bartender since I was a little kid. I absolutely love bartending. And uh, a few years back, actually, I might, I might even might make reference to the fact that Charlotte isn't here. So this picture I took specially for this presentation. Uh, you can see I'm, I'm embarrassing myself quite badly. The idea I was going to be presenting with uh, Charlotte Voicy, who is you know, a very uh, polite, very uh, esteemed lady. And uh, I wanted to embarrass her by putting this photo on here but she had a gut feeling and didn't come. Uh, so I couldn't do that. Now, when I say that I've always wanted to be a bartender, when I was a little kid, I wanted to be a bartender. It makes me very passionate about bartending. And a guy at the back of the room, Jacob Breyers, uh, introduced me to a, a, a friend of his. I was in New York, and we went on a tour around lots of different bars in New York. Now. We're bartenders drinking in New York. I'm not from New York. It's a very special occasion. We went into a bar called Cien Fuegos. Now, in this bar, I read the menu, and the very first cocktail was called the Isle of Manhattan. And it described itself as the bastard son of the Pina Colada and the Ramos Gin Fizz. Now, anyone in the room that knows me knows I love Pina Coladas and Ramos Gin Fizz. I even came out with a cocktail, I call it a mashup, that mixed the pina colada, the Ramos Gin Fizz, and the Long Island iced tea. I call it a Ramos iced tea colada. It's delicious. It takes about half an hour to make. So no, it's not recommended to put it on your list. But this cocktail was absolutely delicious. I seen it, immediately ordered it, and the guy sitting with me, he was like, dude, what are you ordering that for? It's like pineapples don't even belong in bars which started me on a, maybe an hour-long lecture. Uh, by the end of my lecture with him, he was 100% convinced that pineapples belonged in a bar. After that, I went touring around lots of different bars in London, throughout the US, but mostly in London, and I was asking for drinks that had pineapple in them. Nobody was stocking fresh pineapple, so it, I got super upset about that. 
So it started me on a journey that led me to here today, to what is happening here today. I was talking to a friend of mine, Jake Berger. He's a big fan of pineapples. We were wasted at the time, and we thought it would be appropriate to do a session talking about pineapples and how pineapples have come to represent hospitality. And as Jake said, you know, always do sober what you said you would do drunk. So here we are today. Now, I want to again thank Monkey Shoulder for the opportunity that we've got here, letting me be here. But that's all the mention I'm going to make of Monkey Shoulder. Now we'll talk about the history of pineapples. So, you can see here, this little one here, that is a wild pineapple. Uh, not many people know it, well, a lot of people know it now, but the pineapple originated in Brazil. It was a wild plant, it just grew in the jungle. Because of the leaves at the top of the pineapple, it was perfect for, for growing in the jungle. It could collect lots of water, lots of nutrients, the tribes people, the Tupi Guarani, they started eating the pineapple. They ate it a lot. They couldn't grow much in the jungle because there's a lot of uh, bugs, there's a lot of you know, little diseases, and the soil isn't perfect, it's hard to find light. But the pineapple grew. Now what they used to do, they used to take the, the pineapple, they would eat it, and they would discard some of the flesh. From the flesh, from the seeds, the pineapple would grow again. In the old days, the, the very early pineapples, they needed to be pollinated by birds. So birds would come along and they would take some of the pineapple seeds. You don't see it in pineapples today, but there were small black seeds in the original early pineapples. The Tupi Guarani and the other tribes people of Brazil ate so many pineapples that the pineapple itself kind of evolved to suit their tastes. You can see here, the bases got bigger, they got sweeter, the, the crowns got smaller because they didn't need to collect as much nutrients, they were essentially being farmed. Now, the Tupi Guarana used the, the pineapple for more than just eating its flesh. They made rope out of some of the fibers from the pineapple, they made wine. When the first Western people uh, discovered the pineapple, was, I think it was 1493, these guys were already making fermented pineapple wine. So they were well and truly advanced. Now, as I said, the first people came in 1493. The first per Western person to see the pineapple was Christopher Columbus. Now, he landed in Guadalupe on the 4th of November, uh, 1495. And when they, when they arrived, the local tribes people ran up into the hills. The guys basically walked straight into their villages, and they seen pineapples floating around. They were looking for gold, so they were a little disappointed when they found potatoes, peanuts, and pineapples. But they tasted the pineapples, they thought they were delicious, and they, they immediately loaded up their boat, and they brought them back. Now, the first written recipe, uh, sorry, reference, was published on the 28th of October, 1495, by Michel de Cuneo. He said, and I'm going to read from this, there are also some like artichoke plants, but four times as tall, which give a fruit in the shape of a pine cone, twice as big, which fruit is excellent. It can be cut with a knife like a turnip, and it seems very wholesome. So in those days, no one had ever seen anything that looked like a pineapple before. So they didn't know how to describe it. They were try saying artichoke, they were saying pine cone, they were using any kind of description they could. Now the Tupi Guarana, they actually called the pineapple ananas. But when uh, Columbus brought the pineapple back, he brought it back uh, to King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. These two both had crowns of their own. Um, the account of the pineapple being given to the king was well documented. But unfortunately, in those days, they didn't listen too much to what you know, the ladies were saying. It's, the, it's a big shame, but uh, we're assuming that the queen also loved it. Now, uh, when, when it arrived, they, they were calling it Ananas, but the bishop Avila, uh, what's his name? Yeah, the bishop of Avila, I, I, can't, I don't know his actual name. 
he talked to uh, Queen Isabella and he said, Your Majesty, language is the perfect instrument of empire. He convinced her that to change the name of the pineapples, this new, exotic, amazing fruit, um, would forever uh, put her in the history books. So she did, and she called it a pine, or piña. So from there, it uh, began, let's say, the confusion of the pineapple. Uh, this continued throughout history. Now, after the Spanish first got the pineapples, it started to spread really quickly. By 1653, it made it to the Cape of Good Hope, 1654, Madagascar. In 1656, the pineapple made it all the way to China. Now, there's an island in China uh, called Sanya. Has anyone been to China? Yeah? Has anyone been to Sanya? It's cool, huh? Anyway, in Sanya, they grow a lot of pineapples, and they have done for a long time. This picture here was actually uh, drawn to describe the pineapple farms in China. So they, they were very big. They produced a lot of really good quality pineapples. The next stop was England. Now, this is where the, the hospitality side of the pineapple started. Um, the first pineapple arrived in England in 1657 on the 26th of April. And again, the names were all over the place. It was sometimes called ananas. It was sometimes called pina. Sometimes just apple. Um, the name pineapple was actually used to describe pine cones in those days. So when people seen this, they decided it was so good and it was such a beautiful plant that they took the name pine cone, well, pineapple, away from the pine cone and gave it to the pineapple and then renamed the pine cone to be the pine cone. So that was a, that was a big step for them as well. Now, the English uh, royalty, they absolutely fell in love with the pineapple for more reasons than one. It was very difficult to get a pineapple from you know, the Caribbean all the way to England. In fact, the first time it arrived, there was one out of a whole ship that arrived that hadn't rotten. The pineapple, a lot of people don't know it, it, it won't ripen. It won't ripen once it's taken off the plant. You have to keep it on the plant for it to become ripe. So they were actually having to put the plants on the ships and take them and do everything they could to keep them going. Now, King Charles II, he was given uh, pineapples by some cane growers from Jamaica that were trying to get, uh, negotiate a price. And he responded after having tasted it and said it was very wholesome. He said it was delicious. Um, and that started the kind of very wealthy, the elite on a journey to taste the pineapple. They, in fact, became obsessed. Now, because the pineapple was so difficult to take all the way from Jamaica or from the new colonies to, the, to England or to, uh, where else was it, Holland, um, the local gardeners started trying to grow it in Europe. So you can see here, this was an oil painting of what is supposed to be the first ever pineapple that was raised in the West. Um, the pineapple's actually right there. It's really, really tiny. Now, what had actually happened with this, it wasn't grown uh, from a seed or from a, an offspring of the plant. It was actually grown, they brought the pineapple plant all the way to the UK. They put it in one of the, the gardener's uh, greenhouses, and it was allowed to, to mature there. But it took literally years. And you can see by the size of it, it wasn't a very good specimen. Now, these hothouses, they went absolutely crazy. So you can see here, a pineapple w was costing something like 80, I think it's like 80 pounds or something like that to produce in those days. So it's the equivalent of thousands and thousands of pounds for one pineapple. Like the really, really elite were the ones eating pineapples. And the way they did it, the, the Dutch 
had previously been uh, very obsessed with gardening because of tulips. Does anyone know about the, the obsession with tulips they had? Everyone knows what tulips are? Okay, so in, in those days, you could buy a house cheaper than you could buy a tulip at one point. Um, it's probably the same for the pineapple. But what they developed was very technological uh, gardens. So you can see here these pipes. On the side of the houses, they had little uh, fires going. So there was some, sometimes just hot air, sometimes steam. And underneath, they were putting the heat running underneath the ground because to grow a pineapple, you need the exact right soil conditions. The soils need to be nice and warm. You also need warm, clean air. So to begin with, they were putting uh, the, hot, the ovens inside the actual hothouses. And the smoke was causing for the pineapples to die. So they moved those outside. Eventually, they started with these steam pipes. And they also discovered that by taking the soil and putting a level of manure, then a level of tanning bark, then another level of manure, another level of bark, what started to happen was as the manure was breaking down and it was decomposing, it generated heat. And then the bark would keep it in, keep the heat in. Another level, another level. So it, it got extremely technical for the time and it moved gardening forward quite a bit. Now, these English kind of gentry, they basically perfected growing the pineapples, but it was costing them an absolute fortune. People, people were losing fortunes just because they wanted to be one of those social elite eating pineapples. Um, and what this led to, you can see here the ladies like all nicely dressed, checking out their pineapple plantations. What it led to was a culture of the very elite um, serving pineapples at a banquet. The pineapple would always be right in the center of the t table. And if you were l fortunate enough to taste it, then uh, you, it was considered a, a very hospitable uh, gesture to give someone a taste of pineapple. Now, a few rumors also spread. So I told you the Tupi Guarani, the, the Caribs, the different tribes from uh, the Amazon and the Caribbean were eating pineapples. They were also cannibals. So a story started to spread that if somebody who uh, was one of those tribes people had left a pineapple on the front door, it meant that it was safe to come in. That you could come and have a banquet with them, you could eat, and they wouldn't eat you. Now, that's completely untrue. Uh, that wasn't, the, the tribes people were actually really friendly. Um, they weren't like that at all. But it, it was done, uh, that story I think came about so that people who were very wealthy could justify the expense of pineapples so they could, they could have them on their table. It was one of those things, they started to create stories around the pineapple so that they could justify uh, spending as much money on it as they had. Now, uh, you can see here, this guy here, he, his name was, he was the fourth Lord of Dunmore, and he was a Scottish Earl, like a very wealthy, politically connected, he was close to the king at the time. He was sent from Scotland out to the USA to um, become the governor. He was the governor of Virginia, and as well as that, the governor of New York. Now, he did something really interesting. In those days, it was just before the, the revolution, um, the colonists, the gentry of Virginia were you know, very well polished. There was a lot of very wealthy people. But they weren't really keen on English lords coming in and spending huge amounts of their money, effectively, on extravagant demonstrations of wealth, which is what this guy was very, very good at. Now, he uh, would have these massive banquets, and he'd bring in pineapples, like 10s and 15s, 12, 13 of them. OK, there we go. So we got that first cocktail coming out. I might go past this. I'll go. Nope. I'm not going to go past this. So anyway, this cocktail, I'll explain it. Um, I'll get to the actual, I'm going a little slower than I'm supposed to. 
But this cocktail is called the Prince of Wales. Has anyone heard of this before? Yeah, it's amazing. So I'll tell you the story of the Prince of Wales soon, but if you have a little sip, I'll continue with this and then we'll uh, get back to it. Now, Lord Dunmore, uh, he was very unpopular because of his spending habits. He became so unpopular that he had to leave his estate in Virginia and he started to reside on a battleship, um, a British ship just off the coast. The, the locals became so aggressive, they started like, basically at, uh, attacking him. He started a few little skirmishes, he had a few battles with the local people, and he got, totally got his ass kicked. He was really, really bad at, mi at military tactics. But one thing he did, he was the only British lord ever to free slaves. He uh, decided that, because he had the right to do so, that if any, any slaves wanted their freedom, they could take up arms with him to fight the locals. And he freed thousands of slaves, gave them guns, and uh, set them on the locals. They didn't win, unfortunately, but he, it, he went down in history as the only guy ever to, well, only British lord ever to free slaves. Now, he'll pop up a little bit later. I'm going to talk about him after he left Virginia. He did something else really interesting, but we'll talk about it in a minute. Now, the British and you know, European obsession with pineapples, it started to, to move into popular culture. People that couldn't afford a pineapple would build these extravagant stone pineapples. And a lot of them had never seen what a pineapple actually looked like. Sometimes a pineapple would come like this, without the crown because people needed the crown to grow new pineapples. So they would look like this. They'd put the stone pineapple on their front of their houses or on the top corners of their houses, often in fancy restaurants, roasting places where you'd get a nice steak and stuff on a Sunday. And it was a representation of their hospitality. This as well, the, the Wimbledon trophy. Has anyone seen this before? So if you win Wimbledon, you get a gold trophy with a pineapple sat proudly on the top. So these days, they, they basically went crazy for it. Um, you can see the welcome sign here. People had welcome mats. They, um, they put signs out on the front of their houses when they were um, entertaining. This cocktail, the Prince of Wales, it was created by the Prince of Wales. So sometime in November 1841, I think it was, Edward Elbert, he, uh, he was a really interesting character. His, his mother was Queen Victoria. She wasn't very popular. Like, nobody really liked her. I think she might have been a bit of a sour per person. Um, he spent more time as the prince than anyone else in recorded history because his mother basically didn't want him ruling. So she held on to the crown for a really long time. Now, while she was doing that, he became one of the first real kind of playboy, aristocracy kind of guys. He started traveling around the world. He, he dressed very well. He entertained people all the time. He, he went to uh, Mount Vernon in Virginia um, and made friends with the US. They, they didn't like his mother very much, but they seemed to warm to him. He went through Europe. He made friends with the French at the time. Queen Victoria was not popular with the French. This is before 1910. And the French gave him a nickname, the Peacemaker, because he literally made so many friends. Now, for us, I think the most interesting thing he did was create this cocktail, which is just unbelievable. And it had in it uh, either rye whiskey or cognac as a base. Obviously, we're using monkey shoulder for, for, for obvious reasons. And then a little bit of sugar to taste, like powdered sugar or loaf sugar, some maraschino, uh, muddled chunk of pineapple, and it, uh, Angostura bitters and champagne. In 1880s, and this was a, a, a monarch, this was a, a royalty. He wasn't a professional hospitality person or anything. He had taken a combination of expensive champagne from France, a maraschino from probably Italy, Angostura bitters from the Caribbean, and uh, given a choice of rye whiskey, which was clearly coming from America, or cognac coming from France. The cocktail in itself is a, a, almost a perfect example of how 
fair and how much of a multicultural international person he was. And for that reason, I absolutely adore it. This is one of the drinks I order everywhere I go, like uh, if they've got pineapple. It's a bit more common that bars have pineapple these days. Now, moving on from that. The, the, the British, when they, they went crazy for pineapples, they were the, you know, producing them at home, but it stopped being a, a you know, profitable enterprise. After a while, it, it was just too costly to be producing pineapples in the UK or anywhere in Europe. And trade routes and, and you know, uh, shipping got a lot easier. So they started getting pineapples from all over the place. Um, Costa Rica started producing pineapples, so they've got a lot of pineapples. Um, Thailand and the Philippines became really big producers of pineapples. And then Hawaii, a little bit later, became such a big producer of pineapple that it, it almost began, began to be a symbol of the pineapple. You know, like if you see a, a pizza, the Hawaiian pizza with ham and pineapple, it's, you know, it, the pineapple is what makes a Hawaiian pizza a Hawaiian pizza. And it, uh, Hawaii kind of came to symbolize uh, pineapples. But this didn't happen just because H Hawaii was uh, producing the most pineapples in the world. It happened because of, well, Dole. And um, so everyone's familiar with Dole, yeah? Dole and Del Monte, they, as well as a few small producers, joined forces and started marketing pineapples in the early part of the 20th century. They were advertising the pineapple uh, as a joint venture. But obviously Hawaii at that time wasn't actually a, a, a state, uh, so the taxes were extremely high. So they weren't making a huge amount of money. Now in Hawaii, you know, obviously you had Captain Cook. He, he arrived in 1778 to Hawaii, and he actually brought some pineapples with him. So he'd already you know, seeded the pineapple into Hawaii, and it grew really well. Um, he planted about five acres of pineapples, um, and in 1898, the U.S. dropped the tariff on uh, you know, the taxes. And there, a guy called James Drummond Dole, he had studied at Harvard, and at 24 in 1899, he moved to Hawaii. Now, he was a, a massive influence on the pineapple. When he arrived, he planned to, to uh, grow coffee, he had no experience in producing pineapples or growing pineapples, but when he got there and he seen that pineapples were you know, growing really easily and they were readily available, he switched his plan and started producing pineapples. Now, he originally plant, planted 61 acres of pineapples and he had 75,000 of them. Um, in the first year, in 1903, he produced 1,893 cases of tinned pineapple. Now, tinned pineapple at the time didn't re it wasn't common. You know, people were, they were eating fresh pineapples. Um, and tinned pineapple meant that it would last for a really long time, and it was able to go everywhere. Um, so it became super popular. In year two, he made 8,810. By year five, he was producing 50,000 cases of tinned pineapple. So he really kind of popularized pineapple. He made it readily available. But one thing that for me uh, means that it, it's kind of not quite as good, it's a little inferior, the process of tinning pineapples, it actually removes some of uh, the bromelian. Uh, I didn't talk about this earlier, but the pineapple is actually a flesh-eating plant. If you take a cut of fresh pineapple and you rub some on your lips, it's got an enzyme called bromelia, and it will start eating away the proteins. So it will actually eat your lips away. By cooking it, you get rid of that. So you're, you're, you're cooking away some of the, the enzyme that actually makes pineapple so tasty and balances out the sweetness. So it kind of killed it a little bit, and it lost some of its more kind of luxury kind of, I guess, uh, positioning. It wasn't, it wasn't seen as such a luxury anymore. Now, as it, as it traveled around the world, um, people started making lots of different types of drinks. So I'm way ahead on my session now. I've moved too quickly on this last one. But the next drink you're going to get is a Hawaiian Stone Sour. Again, I apologize. But this is a 
cocktail that you know I, I referenced because of the Hawaiian reference. Now, as it pop, as it moved around the world, the pineapple started to to change. People also started to produce different types of pineapple. So I, I'll stick with Dole's picture there. Now, the Dole producers that were were first harvesting pineapple, they were harvesting something similar like this. It's like a, this is a smooth cayenne. There's a old Victorian uh, pineapple, which is a lot rougher. It has aggressive leaves, little spikes all along the leaves. Um, that was the standard uh, type of pineapple back in the day. But by the time Dole was pr producing pineapples, or he, started, he, he moved into it, there were something like 31 different varieties for him to choose from. And he chose the, this, the smooth cayenne, or the Hawaiian style of pineapple. And this became super popular. But in, I think it was the 1950s, um, they created a few different styles of pineapple. They had new, um, I, I think it's the, the Monte Gold in the 1990s, I think it was. Uh, they created a, a style of pineapple that was better for pesticides. It had a lot more um, sweetness. It didn't rot as quickly. So it, it started to change quite a bit. I am getting super nervous now. <laughs> All right. Why is that not changing? Okay, I've lost my space. So for me, that started the decline. Pineapple started to become just a, a flavor. It was, they started to put artificial f pineapple flavoring in sodas. Like, you can see this tinned pina colada. Like, it just, it lost its edge a little bit. You know, it wasn't quite the luxury item that it had been in the past. Now, um, from, what am I doing? Okay, right. One of the things that brought me back to the pineapple uh, and, uh, was obviously my love for pina coladas and things like that, but finding out how to use it. So if you look at this, I'm going to play a video now, right? Get my head back together. The video is, um, the last time I did this presentation, the video, this video didn't exist. I used a very different video, a really old one. This one's quite good. Um, it's going to move really quickly, so I hope the translator is able to keep up with it. But it gives you a full idea of how pineapples are actually produced. Okay? Uh, me trying to explain it is just, it's not going to work. You have to see it for yourself. Okay, let's hope this sound works. Did you know that the pineapple is an aggregate fruit? An aggregate or multiple fruit is formed from a cluster of flowers called an inflorescence. A pineapple inflorescence grows out of the center of the plant where 100 to 200 flowers fuse together to create the fruit. Here we see the various stages of flowering. pineapple has a leathery inedible crust with square eyes. These eyes are what are left of the individual flowers. At the Dole Farm in Moye, Costa Rica, flowering is induced by applying ethylene, a naturally occurring gas emitted by ripening fruit. Using ethylene ensures that our fields ripen uniformly and can be harvested all at once. It takes time, knowledge and patience to grow a pineapple crop. Much of the process cannot be automated and is done by hand. Starting with the right conditions is an important first step. Pineapples grow best in sandy, loamy soil and do well in regions with a high percentage of sunny days, with temperatures ranging from 65 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. If the temperature range is too cool, the pineapples taste sour. If the range is too hot, they taste too sweet. Dole pineapples are produced in some of the world's finest growing areas, and our farms are integrated into the local environment, like the Moye Farm, where both conventionally grown and organic pineapples are cultivated. The first step in planting a new pineapple field is to grow new plants from older mother plants. There are two primary methods of pineapple regeneration, suckers and slips. Suckers are shoots that grow from the base of the plant, while slips grow on the stem of the fruit. 
Gathering this new generation of plants is known as seed selection. 75% of our seed selection is done using suckers from previously harvested pineapple plants. First, the long leaves of the harvested mother plants are cut off, which encourages the young suckers to grow freely and allows them to be removed easily. When the suckers are harvested, experienced farm workers determine their quality. Only suckers that meet our strict standards are used to produce the next generation of Dole pineapples. Quality control inspections ensure suckers are the correct weight. They are segregated by size so that new feet. Uh oh. Come on. I don't know why it's doing this to me. Okay, so that's that, I guess. I'm not going to do that to you guys. Gathering this new generation of plants is known as seed selection. Harvested, experienced farm workers determine their You want to keep watching it? Only yeah? suckers that meet our strict standards are used to produce the next generation Sorry. of Dole pineapples. Quality control inspections ensure suckers are the correct weight. They are segregated by size so that new fields are planted with uniform materials and the plants all develop at the same rate. This new field must be properly prepared following several specific steps. First, old plants that have already been harvested must make way for the new plants. The old plants are trimmed and a microorganism is applied, allowing the plants to decompose faster. A shredder further breaks down the old plant material after which a disc harrow plows the field to break up the soil. This is followed by deep plowing and finally bed preparation. A well-designed drainage system is an essential good management practice. To reduce erosion and capture soil after heavy rains, we use natural materials like bamboo and pineapple plants in our drainage systems. Our experienced dole workers plant each sucker by hand using a specialized spade-like tool. A skilled worker can plant five to 6,000 pineapple plants a day, nearly a quarter of an acre. 14 to 17 acres are planted on this farm every week. Pineapple plants must be fertilized regularly. This is done using a boom sprayer that applies fertilizer directly to the leaves where most nutrients are absorbed. Pineapple plants are perfectly designed to collect water. The leafy crown directs rainwater and nutrients to the center of the plant. These thriving young plants now need lots of sun and time. Depending on the growing region, it can take 13 to 16 months for each plant to produce a mature pineapple. But the wait is worth it, transforming months of effort into a sweet, nutritious treat. Okay. Happy days. So that's how pineapples are grown in, in real life today. Like, that's a nice modern video. Did, did everyone know that the pineapple grows like that? It kind of looks almost like an agave? Yep. Okay, you got ahead of me then. I hadn't, I, until I'd seen that, I didn't really know that. Um, well, I, I knew a few years back. Now, there's a few different types of pineapples. So these, these ones are just the enormous base. Like, I'm not 100% sure what exactly this one is. But you can see this one is the Del Monte Gold that I was telling you about. Um, I'll read out. I've got a, a nice description on the different types of pineapple. There's a Hilo, which is a compact two to three pounds Hawaiian cultivar of pineapple that's an offshoot of the smooth cayenne. The fruit is cylindrical and produces many suckers with no slips. There's a Kona sugar loaf. I've never actually seen one of these, but apparently it's uh, between five to six pounds. The cultivar has white flesh, it's got no woodiness in the center, a cylindrical shape, and it has a high sugar content with no acid. So I think this might even be similar to one of those. Um, there's a Natal Queen, two to three pounds in weight. It, this cult cultivar has golden yellow fresh, flesh, crisp texture, delicate mild flavor, and keeps well after ripening. A Queen Victoria. 
This is the one that I was telling you was the, the popular pineapple of choice back in the day. Um, I'll tell you a little bit later on. I went to an uh, old school Victorian pineapple um, plantation, I guess, and that's what they were growing. They're amazing. But the Victoria pineapple is, in the opinion of a lot of experts, one of the best pineapples. It's got the best taste, the best aroma, but it's a very small size. Grown in South Africa, Mauritius, and the Reunion Islands since 1668, these small fruits thrive thanks to a warm, humid climate. With its golden skin, beautiful, shiny yellow flesh, it reaches an average size of 11.4 centimeters in height. So this is clearly not one of those. They're little. And 8.8 .8 inches, in, uh, sorry, centimeters in diameter, and has spiny leaves. So that's one of the ones with the aggressive spiny leaves. It's much closer to the original wild pineapples. There's a permabuca. I've never seen that as well. Um, again, spiny leaves, two to four pounds in size, and pale yellow flesh. There's a red Spanish. At two to four pounds, this cultivar has pale yellow flesh, a nice aroma, and a square shape. There's the smooth cayenne, which again, there's one of the most popular uh, varieties. Five to six pounds, pale yellow flesh, cylindrical, high sugar content, and low acid. And then there's a few others, the Chimbaca, which is a sub-variety of the smooth cayenne, and then the Del Monte Gold. The, there's an interesting thing about the Del Monte Gold. This pineapple, when it was developed, uh, I think it was yeah, Del Monte, obviously, um, they released the pineapple and they started selling it. Now, it's, it was really tasty and they, it was really successful. After selling, trying to, starting to sell it, they tried to put a patent on it so that no one else could use that particular cultivar of pineapple. But they'd already started selling it. So they weren't able to hold the patent. The patent office basically threw it out. But what they then did was they produced a different variety that was almost identical. They, with that, before they released it, they put a patent on that. Then they told all the producers of, uh, that were using um, similar or the same cultivar of pineapple to cease using it because they own a patent on it which wasn't necessarily true. They owned a patent on this particular type, and they were telling them to stop selling that. And they, the big companies started going to war with each other. It got, it got really ugly. It was, it's, uh, if you read the history, it's, it's really quite funny. Um, the, in Puerto Rico, the Del Monte is it? No. Yeah, anyway, the Del Monte guys, um, they were producing pineapples at a particular farm. Um, the Dole farm started producing pineapples. The Del Monte guys said, hey, hey, how did you produce those? Where did you get the seeds from? And they literally, their response in court was, some man, whom we don't know, turned up at nighttime at the farm and sold us seeds and never told us where they come from. So it, they started, the stories got more and more ridiculous. And then when they realized that a lot of the patents were useless anyway, uh, they dropped the patents, and we can now get Del Monte Gold varieties all over the place. Uh, I think um, Dol calls it like the Supreme Selection or something along those lines. They've got a different name for it. But that pineapple, uh, it, it actually increased p fresh pineapple sales by two or three times, I think it was. Um, it really worked well to resell the pineapple to people. It was in the late 90s, I think. Now, the price of pineapples around the world changes all the time. Um, I've tried to keep up to date with that. I, I literally tried to do it this time, but I'll tell you that the cheapest pineapples I've got were in the UK, which is a bit of a surprise. Like, I think they were 60p. And the, most, the two most expensive pineapples I've bought, one was in um, Zurich. In Zurich, it's about 14 US dollars for a pineapple. Yeah. Um, in Japan, you can get really expensive fruit. So in Japan, it was quite expensive. Is that a question? Yeah, they but basically, um, they fought over the patent for a while. But because people had already been selling it, um, as far as I understand, that's why they dropped it. They dropped all, all the, the arguments they'd been having. They just forgot about it. 
It, I don't know why the pattern was made redundant, but I think it's pro primarily because people are growing this. They're selling it already. It's a bit too late, if that makes sense. Um, that I, all I've read was that it was dropped eventually. They, they got over it, the, the arguments that they were having. Now, um, when I go to buy pineapples, I've got a kind of a strict process. So I'll go through that. So how to pick a pineapple. Now, remember I told you that the pineapple doesn't um, ripen when it's taken off the plant? It has to be on the plant to ripen. When you're picking up a pineapple, mm. oh yeah. Hawaiian stone sour. It was created by Dale DeGroff in 2000. Dale DeGroff, everyone knows Dale DeGroff, right? He's a total legend. Um, it's a uh, blended whiskey with um, some fresh pineapple juice, lemon, and sugar. Real easy. It's absolutely delicious. It's in his, uh, I think it's in Craft of the Cocktail. Okay, so you're picking a pineapple. You go out to the market. The first thing is weight. So if you have two pineapples of similar size, and one of them weighs a lot more than the other, it's because the sugar content is higher. Otherwise, you just got a, a, an empty pineapple full of fibrous, kind of flavorless, proteinaceous bits. So if you pick the heavier one, and the next stage is aroma. So if you can't cut it open and taste it before you buy it. But what I do is I take one of the eyes, I just give it a little squeeze, and you start to get some of the, the juice coming to the outside of the leathery skin. Have a little smell. And if it smells like pineapple, if you're getting the real pineapple flavor, it's going to be tasty. Also, this, this, the base of the pineapple is where it attached to the plant. So if this is rotten, if it's all a little bit kind of, you can see like white kind of fungusy stuff on some of them, not good. Also, the leaves. If they're just falling out, it's not a good sign. Uh, a nice, fresh, ripe pineapple should have strong leaves, nice green color, and also the f pineapple should have fully developed eyes. You've seen in that uh, video that they said the pineapple is actually the fruit is a collection of different uh, flowers. So along here, if, if a pineapple has been picked prematurely, you'll have lots of tiny little ones of these at the top. It, but if it's perfectly ripe, you'll see nice, even uh, flower eyes, if that makes sense. So for me, I'm going to switch on another video. It's strange looking at myself. This is, this, this, I love this, right? I'm going to prepare a pineapple for you in a second. But this video, I fell in love with this guy, a Jean George guy. So I thought I'd share this with you. That's a nice pineapple, by the way. Look at it. Well, before we opened, we went to Paris, and I went to this, uh, this very old library in, uh, in Paris, and I find this old uh, service book from like the uh, 50s. And I saw uh, somebody carving a pineapple. Pineapple already is, uh, you know, is something as a uh, hospitable uh, fruit. Uh, you know, we in Alsace, we love uh, kirsch. We have this beautiful mix of the, the flavor of the sherry and the pineapple goes really well together. We have some organic uh, crystallized uh, rose petal and uh, we, we break them and twist them around. To finish a meal, you know, a jean George with that is, is amazing. Ananas, okay. <laughs> So you can see that that's the traditional way of kind of uh, preparing a pineapple. But I don't really kind of run with that. I, go, I use a corer. It's so much easier. So everybody's seen these before? Right? Now, trick. I wasn't expecting the pineapples to be quite this giant with tiny little leaves. So you're going to have to bear with me. But what I do, this is my favorite preparation. Just cut the top off. Cora goes in here, and you core through, right? Now, when you have the crown left over, you want to have some fun with it. 
So what I do, and I'll pick one with a crown. Take the pineapple. All right, look at that. I'll move this so the camera can get what I'm doing. Can you see? That's making me less nervous, actually. So if anyone's got one of those, they going. So straight down. Oh, that's juicy. Okay. Who wants to eat some pineapple? Yeah, you want some? Can I ask for a volunteer? All right, the first, you put your hand up first. All right. You can't see this. Okay, so, hi, what's your name? Daniel. Daniel, I'm Dean. Nice to meet you, Mike. So you're going to do the same thing as me, right? Sure. I'm going to go first. Straight down. How are we going to hand this out to people? This is what happens. I See, when you, when you do unplanned stuff, that's something as precisely, oh, that smells juicy. All right, look at all that, man. Yeah. Okay, so I usually put a cut down one side, then down the other side, and you got them just falling off, right? So I'm going to go and hand out some of these pieces, right? This is your pineapple. Now, you can't see it anymore, but we're going to make a parrot. Have you ever made a parrot before from a pineapple? No. Okay, so cut the top, do this bit, but you need to keep these leaves as intact as possible, yeah? Okay. Okay. I'm going to move this out of the way. How am I going to do this? Yeah, is there any, anyone might be able to get us some plates? Okay, go for it. Nice and tasty. Mm. Yep. Has anyone seen a parrot being made from a pineapple before? You've never seen it? Okay, you're not going to see the absolute best representation of it today. I'll give you that, okay? But we'll give you the idea of how it's done. You'll have a, you'll have a good sense of it. Are we going to put them in glasses, yeah? Yeah, you're good, man. Okay, up she comes. Listen for the juicy. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can I? Everybody, this is Tim. Tim's awesome. Man. Okay. Just wash my hands there a little bit for you guys. Okay. So, making a parrot. The first step would be trying to pick a, the kind of pineapples that have the really ridiculously long, bushy leaves. It gives you a lot more to work with. But, failing that, we can just kind of try to wing it a little bit. So the first step, we're going to use a smaller knife. I'll leave you this one. So you have a look at it. These are going to be your parrot's wings, the feathers. At the top, where the, the, I guess, fibrous part is, that's really nice and hard, so that's going to be its head. And at the front, so I'm picking the part with very little at the front, that's going to be its chest, yeah? So to start with, we just carve away some of the excess off the top. Again, this is not going to be the best representation. Once you've done that, there's a little head. Right, the next step, and this is the dangerous bit because they're so tiny, is to cut away 
away from yourself. Might even put a bin here. Cutting away. Get rid of this bits. Right? So now he's got a chest. You're cutting away some of the wings. Because we only have such little leaves, what I'm going to do for mine I am going to take some of the leaves off one of the other ones. Okay, there you go. Put them down there. Now, you take a cherry, cut a couple of little eyes from the cherry. Take a toothpick. Where did that outside piece go? You can take one of these guys, cut him like this to make a little beak. Off she go. Whoop. Whoops. Like this. Off she goes. Take this guy, put him in there. This guy on the front like this, right? Might want to use that end of the knife. The little eyes go on the corners like that. And then you put a little piece in here, right? And then he sits on the outside of there. I have your little. So have a go. Use this one, it's nice and sharp. Now, if I can get the picture, can I get the, the picture of the present, from the presentation back, please? Is it still working? This is the thing about technology. <laughs> is it back? Let me see if I unplug it and plug it back in again. Does it help? Nope. Anyway, I was going to show you. Uh, I was going to show you the one that we did last time, which looked a little bit more kind of healthy. Come on. Nope. Crap. Sorry, man. I don't know what happened. How are you doing, dude? I don't know. <laughs> you good? So you want to have a little bit more of a curve, and then at the... F where well, you it's going to be a bald part. He's right. going to be bald? Okay, yeah, rock and roll. <laughs> we can make him a hat, maybe. Did everyone get some pineapple? Um, I've also seen one really cool thing that I'm not capable of doing yet, where guys have cut across here, they've cut out the shape of sunglasses, and then shaved the whole rest of it. So it's actually a pineapple wearing sunglasses, it's quite cool. Okay, how are we doing? Yeah, so that's your parrot. Now, uh, so there's one that I did, obviously, with a much bigger crown. You can see how green it is, like you can get a nice big parrot out of it. Yeah. That one worked quite well. So the drink that you've got coming out is a pina colada. Everyone knows the history of pina colada? I'll talk about it really quickly. Pina colada is one of my favorite drinks. Not only because it tastes amazing, because it makes people happy. It's a happy drink. I discovered recently, as far as I was concerned, the pineapple was the happiest plant, uh, happiest fruit there was. Right? You see pineapple, you, th you think of uh, happy thoughts, you know, holidays and stuff like that. I was corrected. So I was in a cocktail cabin, like I built a bar in my back garden. Um, I call it the cocktail cabin. I was discussing this about the happy fruit, and I was corrected. 
I'm told that the pineapple is not actually the happiest fruit there is. The strawberry is the happiest fruit. And I have to admit that the strawberry is happier. It, like, you know when you see a strawberry, you think of happiness, right? So that's one of the reasons I like the pina colada. The second is that the recipe for the pina colada, the, the, those, that mix of different ingredients, has been around since like 1826. I'm not even kidding. Oh, wicked. Dude, that is awesome, man. Thank you so much. Do you want to take one of these? Yeah, I'm yeah. take my pineapple. I'm going to fill it up with some. You're a legend, man. Thank you so much. Okay. I'm having all sorts of technical difficulties here, guys. Sorry about this. All good? Okay. So, um, has anyone heard of Roberto Cofresi? Well, you're about to hear about Roberto Cofresi. So Roberto Cofresi, probably one of my like, famous, my favorite people that I've read about in history because the guy was a pirate. So he's a pirate and he's cruising around like in the Caribbean. He was based in uh, Puerto Rico. And you can see the statue here that they've made in Puerto Rico of him. He was kind of like the Robin Hood of his day. Uh, he's a pirate, but he was kind of a Robin Hood type character. He was stealing or sacking uh, British and French and Spanish ships, taking the money and distributing it amongst the people in Puerto Rico, like from what I'm told anyway. And one of the things he liked to do as well, he liked to keep the sailors that were on his ship, and they were probably pretty fruity sailors, happy. And he did so by giving them aguardiente. So it was aguardiente because rum hadn't been given a name yet at that stage. Uh, coconut and pineapple. With, I think he might have even had lime in it. So effectively, there were pirates cruising around in the Caribbean in the 1820s, drinking pina coladas, <laughs> sacking ships, and sharing all their fortune with the locals. It's like, to me, that's pretty badass. And that, that combination of flavors must have stuck around because, you know, in, in the 70s, or the 50s, sorry, um, the Caribe Hilton, obviously the story we know, um, uh, Ramon Monchito Marrera Perez, and a whole host of other people claim to have invented it, but with the rise of, uh, oh, what's it called, Coco Lopez, you know, at the, they, got a, they got given a grant from the government, as far as I understand, to um, create an automated process or a, a fast-paced process for making coconut cream. And um, when, when that came out, the blender also came out around the same time, so it was a kind of match made in heaven. The guys from the Caribe Hilton at the time, as far as I understand, were, were making coconut cream from scratch. And then they got this Coco Lopez, they started making pina coladas, they were putting them in pineapples, the rest is history. To juice a pineapple, I, I use a centrifugal juicer. So I put it straight, the same as, a, as ginger, if that makes sense. Um, you, the, it, as, if you take the core out, and you do this, and you juice the pineapple, bear in mind, if it's fresh, it's got bromeliad still in it, so it's going to degrade really quickly. But that's the way I do it. And this one here, the one that we were doing before, is just literally juice. It's unbelievable. But yeah, that's the, that's the pina colada story. Now, there's a few other great drinks that I wanted to mention. Um, for me, Missionary's Downfall. Has anyone had a Missionary's Downfall? I, it's, it's really unfortunate. Beach Bumberry is in another room, probably doing an amazing seminar right now. But he's one of my heroes. I used to work in tiki bars. And um, he introduced me through, I think it was Sipping Safari, to the Missionary's Downfall. And it's an amazing drink. It's uh, rum, um, peach liqueur, pineapple. It's just awesome. A little bit of mint. And I think, I think it was Beach Bum that uh, he wrote a story about Don the Beachcomber smuggling mint into... Uh, Hawaii. Did anyone ever read about that? The guy couldn't get mint in Hawaii. He was opening a bar there. So apparently he took a few mint seeds and he wore a, a hat. When he got onto the plane to fly from California to Hawaii, he put some mint in his hat, flew on the plane. Now it was illegal for him to do that because you can't introduce a new type of weed or cultivar at that stage into Hawaii. So from what I read, he introduced it, and it, I think it was because of the missionary's downfall. I tell that story all the time. Sherry Cobbler, Pisco Punch. Pisco Punch is amazing. 
Um, a Brandy Fix from Harry Johnson's uh, 1900 book, and obviously The Prince of Wales. They're some of my favorite, uh, apart from pina coladas and stuff, cocktails. Now, as we're running low on time, I'm going to start talking about a few other interesting facts about pineapples, and then I'm going to do a QA. and a Has anyone heard of the Fibonacci sequence? So I live my life by this thing, you know, like um, I moved to, to a different country from Ireland when I was eight years old. Like when I was 13, I decided I, like I wanted to be a bartender and I more or less moved out of home. And at 21, I started, I, I stopped drinking like crazy. And at 34, I'm going to grow up. And then hopefully at 55, I'll retire. But the way the Fibonacci sequence works, or they, they call it Fibonacci, but it was discovered before Fibonacci. It was the golden sequence. You have zero and one, one. One plus one is two. Two plus one is three. Three plus two is five. Five plus three is eight. And the numbers keep growing like that. Now, the reason pineapples are really interesting um, as far as the Fibonacci sequence, in nature, the Fibonacci sequence shows up all the time. But the pineapples, natural pineapples, I don't know, this, guy, this guy's a f freaking massive, big freak of nature. But the idea is, across the pineapple one way, there's 13 eyes uh, when it's matured itself, naturally. And across the other way, there's eight. And somewhere in there, I'm not 100% sure how it works, there's also a, t a reference to 21. Now, there's a lot of different plants and, and fruits that uh, produce a, a golden sequence in nature, but this one has three different references to it. And in my opinion, the leaves have three sides. If you look at this, one, two, three, four, five on the little eyes, it's all over the place. So another reason I absolutely adore it for the mathematics of it. I also created a drink recipe um, that's one part plus one part plus two plus three, like the old school sours thing. It's really difficult to do, so I kind of gave up on it. But um, yeah, I, I made a drink into a pineapple. I called it the golden sequence. Another interesting one. Oh. <laughs> Can I get the PPT? <laughs> Another, did you see that? You've seen the last one, right? The last slide. Another interesting one. The world's largest maze is in Hawaii. It's at Wahiyawa Town. I'm hoping I pronounced that right. I haven't actually been there myself, but it's a giant pineapple maze. So if you're ever in Hawaii, go see the giant pineapple maze for me, please. Okay, take a selfie and then send it to me on Facebook. I'll be super happy. And that's something I really wanted to go and see. Something I wanted to do, but we deemed it might be a little bit too dangerous, is cheese and pineapple on a stick. Has anyone ever heard of cheese and pineapple on a stick? Yeah? OK. Yeah, there's a, there's a few. Uh, there's a video, uh, a comedy video that's hilarious. Google it, look it up. I'm not going to play it today, because I can barely understand what the guy's saying, so I don't want to do that to you guys. But cheese and pineapple on a stick was a very popular uh, kind of nibbly thing. People would serve it at cocktail parties in the 70s and stuff. It was tinned pineapple with cheddar cheese on a stick. It wasn't very premium. Now, it was selling a lot of pineapples and a lot of cheese. So somebody somewhere, I can't remember, remember where the actual reference was, decided they needed to make cheese and pineapple on a stick more luxury. So they came up with a story that the musketeers in, in France, in uh, some you know, Louis Trey or whatever his name was time, some very, very posh person uh, was having a banquet. And it was a standard practice that the musketeers would demonstrate their skill by standing at one side of a room with a sword. And another musketeer would stand at the other side of the room with a pineapple throw the pineapple across the room, and that guy on the other side of the room would catch it. And then they would demonstrate just how good they were by taking a wheel of camembert, and that across, and if he could catch the camembert, they'd get a big round of applause. It's a bullshit story. <laughs> Turns out it's not true. But I wanted to make it true by getting a, a big sword and throwing it across the room. But Swords and drink, we decided, was a socially irresponsible idea. But that was, that was quite a cool story, so I thought I'd bring it up. Now, these are actual photos I've taken. That's probably why the quality is not very good. But you can see here, 
That is growing in London, that tiny little pineapple. Um, it, that, that one's at Kew Gardens. You go into some of the greenhouses there, and there's little tiny pineapples everywhere. It's amazing. It's really cool. Um, we even, uh, well, Bompus and Par did an event in, in London in Kew Gardens, and they made a giant, like, 16-meter, like, 30 or 40-foot pineapple in the center of a lake, and you could get on a little boat and sail, like, wheel your, sail yourself out to the pineapple and go through a tunnel that smelt like banana. It was pretty amazing. Um, this photo in the top right, you can see Jake Berger there. So we're missing Jake today, but that was myself and Jake went out to the gardens, the forgotten gardens of St. Heligan. And that, that was one of the old, old Victorian era pine houses making... Uh, the pineapples in the tradition method, traditional method, like growing them in the UK, and they're still doing it the same way today. So they're using the manure, they're using the old kind of hot houses, and they're growing pineapples. They say it takes anywhere up to eight years for them to fully mature. So it's a quite expensive process, but they're doing it for historical reasons. This one here, has anyone ever heard of the Dunmore House? Now remember the crazy... Lord Dunmore that I mentioned earlier that I was going to come back to, after he got basically thrown out of the U.S. because he was too much of a pussy, um, yeah, literally that, he went back to Edinburgh and he basically built that. And it is absolutely amazing. You can stay in there. It's, you can actually, yeah, I haven't done it yet. I'm, I'm working on it. But you can stay. There's a, I'll use this pointer actually rather than getting up. Um, down here, there's like a two-bedroom apartment, and in here, that's basically a sunroom. Now, the bottom half of this house existed before he, you know, uh, put the pineapple on the top. We don't know who the architect was that did the pineapple, but that is a giant, like, I think it's like 60-foot-high pineapple in Dunmore House. Now, I've been there. This is, a, this is the back of it. Um, we had to jump a fence to get to the back of it. You can see, you can see how, how big it is. That's a door that you can walk through. You've got the windows here. And then there's an entry down here. This place had thousands of pineapples back in the day. And, and the guy, after all of the luxury he, that he had in Virginia and everything, went back to Edinburgh, built this so his neighbors would know how rich he was, and spent his days in his townhouse in Edinburgh entertaining people, giving them pineapples and all that sort of stuff. It's stone. It's, it's like... If you go back to this, if I go back to this slide, you can see here, there's lots and lots of, it's like bricks that have been made out of concrete. It, the whole thing's um, essentially concrete. I've got, I took a photo of the specifications of it. You can see here. So that's, that's the old uh, spec of the house. One thing, uh, everybody knows what a monkey shoulder bottle looks like, right? Look at that. It's a monkey shoulder bottle in the middle, Right? But that shows, uh, if you can see here, this is the, look how nervous I am, I'm shaking. This is the little bits of stone. So they've actually just built an inside and then put the stone uh, decorative pieces on the outside. It's really cool. It's beautiful. This is me and Jake. Is it taking a selfie? Yeah, the, the pan panorama thing had just come out. It was quite cool. Right, that's a long time ago. But that gives you another idea of just how big it is. Now, this, this guy was obviously obsessed with pineapples, right? He even went back to the US again after this. Um, I've started to obsess a little bit about pineapples. So I made my own uh, shrine to hospitality. Like I told you, I always wanted to be a bartender. Um, the unfortunate truth of, of where I am right now, I'm not very good with money. So I don't have the money to get my own bar, but one day I will when I grow up, after I'm 34. And uh, I've always wanted to have my own bar so I can bartend my way. I can, I can host people the way I want to host people. And last year I bought a house and I built a bar in my back garden. So the bar in my back garden, you can't see it because it's... If, can we turn the lights down a little bit? Is that the room lights? But is that possible? The, the lights? It's going to happen. It's definitely going to happen. We'll use the force. Okay, so you can see here, I got, you've got little pineapples here, little wooden ones on either side. 
This was a, a gift that was given to me. I'm missing a lot of the pineapple stuff because when I took this photo, I'd, I'd given a bunch of stuff away. So you've got this little welcome sign that was given to me by Grant Nee, one of my brand ambassadors. And you can't see it, but in the middle, we've got like a massive shrine to pineapples. I've got crystal pineapples, I've got uh, wooden pineapples, brass pineapples and everything. But for me, when I was talking about hospitality, this is the ultimate in hospitality. Can we get the lights back up again? I'm sorry. Um, this is the ultimate in hospitality. When I bring someone in, into this cabin, they're not paying for drinks. I'm, I'm making them the cocktails to the best of my ability. And it, it's, it's just pure hospitality, it's service. And I'm quite fortunate to have a beautiful girlfriend who allows me to do this kind of stuff. Um, but since uh, I've had this cabin and I started like bartending again, it, it's, just, it's, it's, it's just my happiness. It's, it's the thing that makes me really happy. And this is what, as much as this comp presentation was a lot of geeky uh, information about pineapples and a, a, a hell of a lot of mistakes, for me, um, the true kind of benefit of, of being a true hospitality person, if you're completely selfless and you really just want people to have a good time, it's more than making cocktails. It's more than giving them drinks quickly. If, you, if you're being hospitable to people, if you're true hospitality, you get a, a positive energy back from every single person that you're serving. And if you've been a bartender for a few years and you're, you're, you have one of those nights, has, has anyone in the room had a night where everything's gone really well, the customers are all really good, and at the end of the night you feel like you could fly? You feel that good? Is that a question? Like for me, that not being able to, to not bartending all the time is that's the one thing I miss. And the more I study it, the more I look into it, it's the hospitality that does that. It's not about serving drinks, it's about serving people and getting that hospitable feeling back. So for me, the pineapple, when I went to do this presentation, I was talking about hospitality, uh, going around and asking for a pineapple, the symbol of hospitality in a bar, and the bartender's not knowing that the pineapple is the symbol of hospitality. The bartender's not respecting the pineapple, not knowing its history. That's what led me to this presentation. And the more I tried to distill what hospitality is and what that feeling is, um, the harder it got for me. The only way I could do it was to explain to you that that's my true happiness, that's, is hospitality. And if you take one thing from this seminar, it should be that when you're serving someone, if you're truly serving them, and your focus is to make them happy, because that's what a bar should be. It should be to make people happy. That's what hospitality is about. Uh, if your focus is making people happy, you can't go wrong. If you've been to a bar and someone's truly trying to show you a good time and make you happy, if the drinks are not perfect, you don't mind. If the service is a little slow, you don't mind. If you go to a bar where the drinks are absolutely perfect, the service is impeccable, and the bartenders are rude, it's horrible. Am I right? So for me, the, having the, symbol, the pineapple as a symbol of hospitality just remember, to remind you of why you're, why you're there, that's the most important thing that you can take from this presentation. That's why I collect lots of pineapple stuff. That's why it's front and center in my bar. So that it reminds people that's what we're there for. And that's it. That's all I have. So, okay, I'm going to take some, if you guys have some questions or anything like that, uh, you can shoot. And otherwise, I, I, I do apologize in the middle of that presentation, I got very nervous. And started, uh, I was like contradicting myself and jumping all over the place, but... We kind of got to the end, so. There's a microphone coming. Please don't drop the mic. Um, I just had a question about uh, the pineapple harvesting. It looks like they do it by grafting, basically. So mm -hmm. I was wondering if there are many varieties, or if there's if it's like a heterozygote, if it has a lot of like spontaneous different varieties that crop up if you don't graft it. Um, these are uh, the the guys. If you go onto the doll website. And this is amazing, because I went to find that video from the last presentation. When I did this presentation the first time, it was three or four years ago. I went back onto the, to, I went onto the Doll website, and they've got loads of videos, breaking down how bromelian is, is good for your joints, you know, like um, the health benefits of pineapples, how it's grown, the organics. Um, from my understanding, they're taking their crowns and taking the slips. They're using the identical type of pineapple over and over again. 
but you can, through one uh, supplier, get different types of pineapples. Um, I'm, I'm not that savvy on exactly how to order them. Um, I literally go to my local uh, Tesco, which is the biggest supplier of pineapples in the UK, and I go for the organic Costa Rican ones. Um, and there is a Tesco that tends to get really, really good pineapples, but I, you do have to kind of be picky. I'm not sure exactly whether or not they have different cultivars of pineapples in the same fields. I'm not sure. And that spray, so did you see the spray that was being sprayed on? Um, they kind of went through it really quickly. This, this is a, an enzyme that they, ethylene or something like that, they spray onto the pineapples so that they're, in about six months, they'll all ripen at the same time. So they can be harvested all together. The, that discovery was made by accident when a pineapple farmer had taken the leaves and the crowns and the other pieces from around the outside of the, the pineapple plants, and to get rid of them, he burnt them. And the smoke was uh, kind of spread over the uh, pineapple plantation and made them all ripen at the same time. And that's how they discovered it. It was an accident. Mango, mangoes can do it as well, apparently. Uh, which one? Oh, yeah, okay. Bananas. Yeah, my second favorite fruit. Any other questions? We'll go real quick because we've only got like five, ten minutes. So you're next. Uh, first of all, thank you for lectures about uh, pineapple and yeah, thank you. the chance <laughs> to come to Mexico. I really enjoy it. I already took this uh, lecture two years ago. Oh, okay. It was amazing. I only want to know, when you show us a photo uh, talking about the pineapple looks like a agave or a mezcal plant, mm -hmm. when we cut it, uh, the mezcal plant also called pineapple, the heart of the agave plant, and also the flavor, sometimes it, it tastes a little bit like a pineapple. Mm. Did you investigate or did you know something I, about that? Well, the, the, the fact that the agave is called a piña, I, I thought there was some connection. But actually, it's, it's, uh, it's not even the same strain. It's not the same type of plant. So it's a, it's a very different plant. Um, I wasn't able to find any connections with ag agave and pineapple. It'd be nice if there was, um, especially here. But uh, I couldn't find any of that. The, uh, from what I understand, the agave is asparagus or something it's related to. Am I right? So that's not crazy talk. Um, and yeah, the pineapple is a bromelia. So I think one of the things, the flesh eating part of it and the fact that it comes from flowers would make it a very different plant. It looks very similar. But again, it's a, they're both South American plants. So they might have grown a certain way to collect as much sunshine and, and rain as possible. You know? Anybody else? Yeah. I got a mic. Uh, yeah. What's your preferred method of adding, uh, adding pineapple to a cocktail? Is it shrub, tincture, simple syrup, or just straight up juice? Uh, to me, it, the, okay, to me it, t it depends on what the cocktail is. Um, if I'm making a Prince of Wales, I make a pineapple syrup. But when I do that, I, um, instead of using sugar and as much maraschino, um, when rich? I do that... Is it rich simple? It, 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 no, it, yeah, it'll be rich, rich sugar. It'll be thicker, but I don't, I don't cook it or anything like that. I take the pineapple when it's as ripe as I can possibly get it. Um, I make sugar syrup. I bring it. I don't bring the sugar syrup to the boil. I bring it up so that it's it's ready to bubble, but it's not quite bubbling. And I take nice thick ripe pineapple and I steep it in the sugar, and you get a lot of the pineapple flavor from it. Um, but you need good pineapples and you need to, a little bit of patience. Um, I do the same with banana. If you let banana ripen until it's black in the fridge and it ripens evenly and you get the aroma, cut it up, warm the sugar syrup, don't boil it, drop the banana in, the aroma comes out, you can strain the syrup off. Same thing as I do with pineapple. I then muddle the pineapple up, put it into ice cube trays, and I have frozen cubes of sweetened muddled pineapple in my uh, fridge that last for months. So when I'm making a pina colada, instead of taking just straightforward pineapple, I'm now putting frozen pineapple cubes in there. I can get coconut water and it tastes amazing. Do the same with the banana. Mush it up. Banana daiquiris. So good. Is there, is that, does that answer the question? Is that, um, if, I'm, if I'm making French martinis and I've got really good fresh ripe pineapple, I'll muddle them. But if I'm having a house party or something like that, I will literally set the cabin up with all the ingredients in the freezer so that I'm not 
making as much mess because I tend to be drinking while I'm serving. So I <laughs> keep the mess to a minimum. The cultivation of pineapples, as you demonstrated here, is quite similar to how they're cultivating agaves at the moment, particularly in Jalisco. Okay. Uh, there's a concern coming up with the agave plagues that will actually wipe out all the agaves because they're from the same mother plant, so they've got the same DNA structure. Yeah. Have you heard anything that this is a possibility with pineapples as well, that we put, could have a shortage in the future? I'm not, I'm not absolutely sure. They're still cultivating a lot of different types of pineapple, and it's so spread out, I don't know if they'll have that same problem. The pineapple's a pretty resilient plant. Like, like I said, it evolved so that you can, in the right climate, you can just dump it in. If for Queensland, for example, where I've spent most of my life, they've got their own cultivar of pineapple. And uh, the Thai pineapples are slightly different. So if it was to wipe out one, I'd assume that the other ones around the world would be, would be saved because they're slightly different. Bananas are the same, having the same issue as well, aren't they? Because they're genetically identical. They're close to us. They're 70% of what we are, apparently. Anybody else? Have you ever heard about the story of... Uh, um, People renting pineapples. Yes. For the, is it true? Or? It's true. Yeah. People rented pineapples when they didn't have the money. They would rent a pineapple um, and not serve it. That's again why being served a slice of pineapple was a big deal, and um, uh, it was just to show that they were wealthy or that they were in a significant position. But after a while, when the pineapple became more common, um, you could buy a slice of pineapple for one shilling or something. So poor people started to actually get to taste it. Um, but they weren't the best pineapples that were landing on the shores. And second of all, have you ever uh, tried tepache? The which one? Tepache. No. It's a Mexican, <laughs> yeah. What is it? You must. <laughs> hey, what did I do? I don't know. Tepache is a Mexican, mm, so basically you uh, ferment F yeah, ferment pineapple um, juice. No, but also the outside of the pineapple, the skin of the pineapple. Okay. Then you put it to um, to ferment, and then it's a uh, very. Can you get that everywhere here? Yeah, in the streets. All right, the I'm pache. having some. That's the next, very next thing I'm going to be drinking. Really? Okay, cool. I'm learning new stuff. Uh, I have a story, I don't know the extent to which this is apocryphal, maybe you can shed light on it, but I feel like um, I've heard some type of story that, especially um, in the American South, there was like a tradition when somebody would go to another plantation, they would be presented with a pineapple when they got there, and then when it was time for them to get on the road again, they would be presented with a second pineapple. Yeah. Uh, have you heard anything? I've heard, there's a, I've heard a lot of stories about uh, Southern hospitality and integrating pineapple into it. Um, the one I showed for the, uh, Lord Dunmore was just one example. But I've, I haven't heard exactly that you would be presented with a pineapple, but pineapple was used to welcome people um, all through the South. And New Orleans actually was one of the first pl places uh, to start growing pineapples successfully. Yeah. So yeah, um, that, they, they, they were old school pineapple uh, hospitality people, which made it very relevant when I was in New Orleans. But yeah, I haven't actually heard that exact uh, story, but it would make a lot of sense to me. Um, pineapples were, were given to people to, to show off, basically. Is there anyone else? Okay, cool. Thank you very much, guys. And, and and I'm, I'm by no means like a super expert on pineapples or anything. I just really love them. Sláinte. Salut. Cool.